Shall we begin? Let's begin now. All right, lads. So, thoughts what? on the future of our industry as you put it, Johnny? Do you want to lead off there, Christopher? Or shall I? I'll, I'll, I'll lead off, I suppose. Um, the thought is on the industry, the industry, golf industry, coaching industry, probably a bit of both. Um, I think it's, it's, it's probably like everything. We all panic and sort of say, where's it going, where's it going, this, 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 this. And I sort of knew we were going to be chatting about it and how to think about it. And it's all industries evolve. Some of them evolve naturally. And there's things or items that make it evolve, you know. The two main things that I came up with that we have to evolve with is technology and rules changes. So there's going to be developed, if you look at technology over the last 25 years, it's went from video to like launch monitors to 3D. That would be the three main things that I see. There's going to be something after 3D, so it's adapting to that. And you can't, I don't think you can argue that all of those types of technology has changed the shape of coaching. Or how we coach and it has inherently improved golfers you know there's no doubt about that mm -hmm. um so wh whatever technological advances there's going to be is going to change or shape our coaching maybe slightly to do with more brain activity or things like that and also rules changes you know so there's a lot of talk at the moment of the bifurcation of the rules for pros and amateurs and golf's the only sport that I know of that um, for pros the equipment's actually easier to use and when you think about it it's absolutely ridiculous I think you know so the equipment for me I wouldn't say has to change it should change um, and the fact of there's no reason why pros shouldn't have like much less gear effect on their driver so if it hits the door it goes more offline or they lose more distance, or the sweet spot smaller, or the COR smaller. You know, for me, that for me, hitting it out of the middle of the club is a, is a big skill, as well as hitting it far, or chipping it well, or course management. And although I think you should be rewarded for being athletic and powerful and skills, um, athletic, and maybe your work ethic in the gym, and you're an absolute true athlete, I don't think it should be the only one. And that's the way it's going for me. So there would be. The things I would start to look at. There's gonna, there's no smoke without fire. There's gonna be rules changes at some stage because you can't. Keep, I don't think the sustainability and courses going over eight thousand yards. It's just not realistic. And I don't know through no research. I don't buy that everybody wants to see everybody hit at four three fifty off the tee because I don't. <laughs> through no, no research. <laughs> you know, well, I've done absolutely, absolutely no research, but here's what I think. <laughs> Well, this is what it is. It's opinions. That's called, an, that's called an opinion, Chris. <laughs> opinions. That's what we're all here for, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, so, like, do we want to see everybody hit at 400 yards? I would doubt that. Um, because if you're back to our slight discussion beforehand, um, if, you've, if you're a young kid growing up and you're seeing people smash at 400 yards and you're pumping at 120 off the tee because you're eight years old, it's just so far out of reach, you're going to have so much drop off, you know, but we know going forward that, that it's possible. So for me, I'd like to see, I'd like to see the rules developments and it's happened before with grooves. Um, and the rules are developing all the time. The time we look for a golf ball, simple things like that to help move the game forward. So the, 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 yeah, Jeff, go for it. Hey, finish your point there. I want, to, I want to devil's advocate you, Jeff. Finish your point there. I'm just getting in ahead of Donald in case he can't because I know he wants to say something. I was, more less, I was more or less finished there. So the coaching developments are going to be, we're going to have to develop as coaches through things that maybe aren't in our control for rules and technology. I don't think we're going to have the choice and to say, right, we're going to change this and that's the way it's going to be. That would be my two main points. Well, again, I sort of agree with you there that if rules come along, you change, don't you? You know, if they outlawed... If they said the most lofted way, just 50 degrees, you just learn to. Yeah. So that's, I, I, but right, to devil's advocate, right? Say somebody comes along, a really talented 
um, newly designed runner and start running nine five. Do you say no? It's unfair. He needs to change his shoes and make them heavier. That's ridiculous. What he's running, that's not realistic. No. no. So that's the first thing. The first thing. So I'm just being devil's advocate here. I'm a I'm a purist like you. Right? But it's and also don't but forget. That, but that the, but that runner is it, it's the equipment that's helping the players. Well, say there's say the light. Like, like, it's say, not the takeaway that the athlete. If if somebody has a born exceedingly athletic and they work really hard that will still be rewarded by the ruse changes because they'll still hit it the furthest I'm not saying they shouldn't hit it the furthest but there still should be a, a, a point on accuracy in the club face you can hit a 10 mil off centre and hit it 320 down the middle for me that's not I don't see how that's skillful well that's a real big debate I'm just saying that sometimes when we go to our sports that I know what you're saying, but because it doesn't it doesn't lie well with us. We grew up in an era where hitting at two sixty was good, but don't forget James Braid hit at two ten, and then Jack Nicklaus came along, and we loved Tiger when he came along. He hit at 300, 305. So I think you can't stop that, Joe. You know that time we went to that thing with the RNA. This, you were there with over in the Belfry, remember the uh -huh. room? the yeah. guy Steve Otto said conclusively that distance had come from three factors: the club, the ball, and the human. It's all three of them. Even look at the way people go at the golf ball now. And, yeah. Um, there's less of a penalty for spraying it and it's uh, the golf ball doesn't go offline as much all these things so yeah. but what I was going to say was should be any penalty for the human being you know whenever you're bringing other factors that is not well I'm not saying it's not skillful but for me hitting it out in the middle of the club is part of something that should be really at the high end of the game you know like snooker the, the, the pockets are smaller for pros for example you know, I think the ball shape or something in the NFL is a little bit different or harder like to college, cut or something, you know. College, yeah, uh, different to college, yeah. And I don't know. Rugby, I, yeah, it's yeah. different with the, VA, the VAR rules, you know. You, you can't get away with as much and that, that, that sort of thing, you know. So you have to, you have to tailor your game for that. Well, I, that's, so that's fine. So the, the conversation is, where's our industry going? I think it will follow the rules. It has to. But my... If you think of it, think of it like a run race where they put out a pacemaker, I think our pacemakers and what we do day to day are always the tour. And the tour follows money, basically, that needs money to go around for sponsorship and wherever they put money up will play. So whatever there's money in, we'll end up being magnetically drawn to that. So if there's money in, obviously, the better you play, the performance gets higher, then you make more money. So we're drawn to what gets performance because we see Bryson DeChambeau with two launch monitors or hear Molinari talking about uh, going to a power coach or... <coughs> These guys like Scott Foss and whatnot will follow those trends, I would say. Just in the terms of the high end coaching we do, the better players will follow anything that the tour do. So, if we, it's like what we're looking think of where the tour was 10 years ago. We're seeing that in amateur golf now with like Sir Donald there doing stats packages or specialized coaching or equipment being made readily available for all amateurs playing around the world. You know, if we say we're 10 years behind the tour in terms of like seeing us on the ground as, as our, in, in Irish amateur golf. Well, what's the tour doing now? Well, they're maybe using different, playing different formats of the game. Maybe we'll be playing different formats in amateur goal. Maybe we'll be doing sixes, 12 holes, mixed tournaments. You know, it seems weird, but that's if we follow that trend, I think there's a chance that will uh, that will happen. Maybe there'll be a world amateur tour someday. Maybe they'll be like the USAM. Maybe they'll still be called the British AM, the USAM, European AM, all the category ones. Maybe there'll be like 10 or 11 big events around the world that any aspiring juniors who want to play at a higher level will be through and that's how there'll maybe be a ranking for those types of players and a ranking for other types of players whether it's like a, a PJ tour and a corn ferry tour I don't know it'll take it'll take something like like they have done it before I suppose like look at the they put a limit on the sea of war they limited the head size of 460 yeah. cc's like Usually, I, like what'll happen is it'll take like it'll take like an equipment manufacturer or a group of them to get together and go. Do you know what? If we actually make if we said all driver heads could only be four twenty, that means every amateur in the world will have to go out and get a new driver. So there's more yeah. money in our back pocket. So let's go. Do you know what I mean? It'll probably take it'll, it'll probably take something like that. And then I think the other the other side of it is too is like Tiger was a game changer because. Not only did he hit it further than everyone, but he had the shot making of a savvy. Like he could hit rope and hooks, fades, draws, high, low, spin it, run it. So right now, everybody's like focusing on hitting it far. 
But the next Phenom will be somebody who not only hits it really far again, but also has the array of like shot making. And that's where like, um, I think you'll, I think, I, I don't think, I, I think you'll get that skill, but I think in terms of the rules changes coming, it'll take a Phenom to destroy Augusta or to shoot 15 under at a US Open when everybody else is level par for the powers that be to come in and go, oh, we need to do something or else this thing's going to derail here. Well, if you, if you take, right, say, say, say the next great player, <coughs> on like even as much as hard to believe, better than Rory or better than Dustin Johnson, if they're even a player that could dominate and you were allowed to design him, if you said this player has to go and be significantly better than Kepka, Johnson, McElroy, speak all of them. What 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 comes into your mind? there? what do you see? Well, you see a Tiger type dominant player. You know, hitting it fifteen yards further than everybody else. The shot shape and putting everything under pressure. The mindset, being an athletic beast. You know, everything you can imagine. Tiger was twenty years ago, just with this feed. I think the yeah, thing but- that I see. Probably would be yeah, definitely you're right. Like maybe like the driving of a Rory or whatever. But I would see the short game being like the ability to get up and down 70, 75 percent of the time. Because yeah. well, know, if you if you if you well, Tiger was significantly longer than Mark O'Meara than Lee Johnson. So you need somebody who's thirty longer than Dustin Johnson. And really, when you start hitting it that far, you're only hitting the at iron down. You know, really? So you need somebody who's viciously long and pretty straight, and very good with the scoring clubs, has to have a putting touch, and then a mind. Wanted to, Tiger wanted to destroy everybody. He didn't. Wasn't he? Wasn't there on holiday? Like he wanted to yeah. beat. He wanted to embarrass you. Like of course. Like, did you listen to the Matt Wallace uh, podcast yesterday? No. He was. I listened Matt to Wallace that. with Cameron McCormick. Yeah, was, yeah, uh, yeah. When he played with Tiger, uh, Robert Rock. He, Rock he's Robert Rock coaches him now. And um, he was playing with Tiger. It must have been in the Open, I think. I think it was the Open. Was it? And Ro- he's asked Robert Rock for his advice. And he says, yeah, Matt, just remember, everybody there isn't watching you. They're watching Tiger. And Tiger won't be watching you either, so don't worry about him. And he said that really helped. You know, so like, you get you get, just get that aura about somebody, you know, that's, it's just different. It's just a different aura. You know, whether it's an Ali or a... Ronaldo or Messi or a... But the thing as well though is is Johnny <clears throat> like I love that old I love that old phrase. Talent hits a talent hits a target that nobody else can hit and genius hits a target that nobody else can see. Mm-hmm. So before the next year, we probably we're not the genius, so we won't be able to see what they'll be able to do, but somebody will come along to change the game. Yeah. Do, like like who would have thought that like Messi would be the best player in the world yeah. in a generation, and he never and he never runs. The fucker never runs. He runs less than oh. any other player on the pitch. And he's, his, yeah. his, his runs are so incisive that he's impossible to knock over. Who would have think... thought that a five foot seven guy in the modern age of strong athletes would be the most dominant soccer player it's in effect. the world? It's a, it's Tom, it's Tom Brady. Look at yeah. Tom Brady's combine scores. He couldn't run. He could, but he, but in in the pocket in the moment, he was on. He was incredible. It's the it's effectiveness like, of these players, isn't it? It's the effectiveness, you know. So we hear of Ronaldo and Messi scoring so many goals. Many, would we never hear of their fails ever? You know, I remember going to an AC Milan match there years ago, and the old Ronaldo was playing, and he didn't run outside of a thirty foot circle. He didn't move outside of a thirty foot circle. Fat Ronaldo, so much. Well, they call him Fat Ronaldo, but he was a genius, and. The real Ronaldo, and um, he didn't run outside of a thirty-foot circle the whole match until the ball came down to his end of the pitch. He scored two in the one by two. You know that's a genius. That was, you know, but they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't, they're not, they're not there to be everything. They're not there to be all things to all people. They're there to do a job and do a job well. There's the thing. The thing that the next phenom will do, Johnny, is he will shoot significantly lower scores than the rest of the field over a consistent basis. And it'll be a mix of all sorts. And it, we don't know what it'll probably be like. We don't know. It'll probably be they'll be best at, in every category. And we don't know God knows what ingredients will go into making it up. But they'll just they'll 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 shoot twenty five under around Augusta. They'll birdie five holes on each nine. They'll do shit that we've never even imagined. And it's probably because they believe it's possible, and the rest of us know that. Yeah. They're probably crazy enough to believe that they can do this stuff. 
Maybe somebody that maybe there might be somebody that hits a fucking two ninety, but can hit four irons through a, the threat die of a needle. I, like you know, you just never know what shape look, it'll look take. At the, look at that amateur. Was it that amateur last year, Johnny? At South Africa, the young lad in South Africa, the sixteen year old. He's turned pro. General. He's turned pro, Joe. Fella, forty eight under par for two events or something. Oh, that fella! Yeah, the first three events of the year it was. Yeah, that kid. I'm talking about the one. Remember the one did well in the SA Open. The young lad, he's sixteen. Oh yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's yeah, turned pro. Aye, right, that kid there. Um, yeah, um, I don't know his name. Jarvis, somebody, Jarvis. Uh, Casey, is it? Uh, Casey Jarvis. He won the he won the South African Amateur and uh, won three events. Then he shot twenty three times twenty under par. So yeah, so no, it, well, that, well, well, they get back to what we said. That, yeah, so if, so a person like that comes along and raises the bar, and only so few people jump it. Then that will have an effect probably on how we coach because that'll be the you think all the all the generations from Hogan to Watson to Faldo to Tiger. We now look at Rory's golf swing. You look at Cameron Champs probably or if like some are super long Tony Fina. That becomes an influence. They are our industry, doesn't it? it becomes even, where we even look at long driver uh, swings yeah. a lot now as well. Yeah, yeah. Here's a here's a here's a big shift that I see is I think video. When video came in, it became all about like technique looking good, right? Yeah. Uh, right, let's be here on plane, let's do this, do that. And you can suddenly start to see a shift now where like it's not so much like in the in the in the in the technical definition of looking good, it doesn't, but it performs, it's what it does, it's what it does that impact that counts. Like look at like all like all the funky, all the funky techniques. All the funky, uh, all the all, all the funky movements, and yet, like, it's performing like unbelievably well because some over style, isn't it? I really, it, it really is, and, it, and I think it's only going to go more and more and more and more. Yeah, and more that way. it's going to be the ability to create the create the, the mental map necessary for the shot in front of you, and not create the position of where the club is. Yeah. Um, like, look, which is sort, which is sort of how we how golf started a little yeah. bit. You know how you just played out in front of you. Like that. Look at look at look at the swings of like. I think it's going to go back to like. Look at the Jimmy swings Brewer. of like Darcy and Snee oh, yeah. and, and Jimmy, Jimmy Bruin. Yeah. All these all these guys. And then we went to like video because stuff got on TV and everybody yeah. started hitting positions. And then yeah. you go back and it's going to go like Matthew Wolf, Victor yeah. Hovland, all these guys coming through. Real kind of like like you know would anybody touch Ricky Fowler? No, the way he was when he came out first. Yeah, exactly. Didn't even know. Then again, you look at, I, I agree with you, Donald, but then you look at, listen to Butch, and he said you got up a good setup. I looked at that um, that day they did the Florida for those TaylorMade players. All those new guys have got fun, funky looking grips and funky looking but feet positions and funky, but it's like the coaches have said that's not important. How does the club deliver and how often can you do it? So it's like we're still undecided about all that. And oh, then there's also the, well, I know we were talking about our industry, but there's also the, the person you're working with, you know, how. I think the final frontier is the mind. It's like how committed are they? Ultimately, boys, you know my stance. It's how bright are the lights you can play under. That's ultimately. You said a minute ago. How, what do you score when you have to score? And you can pretty much do it any way you want. That's what I'm, when you start coaching. You want them to fit into your model. You want because you, you know people are judging how they look the same way as we were at that time. But ultimately, it's just like how what can you do when it counts, and you can do it any way you like. If you can hit those metrics, you know or the Mount Rush. You know that that's where you have to be now. But how can you get there? That's it's like, like you always say, Johnny. It's like it's not how good you can play; it's the level you can play at. Yeah, I mean, I shot sixty-three at Carlo. Big deal. I shot one hundred and fifty in the Irish Open because I couldn't play. You know, it's like it's, it's a level you can play. Because we've all all of us here have shot mid sixty somewhere along the line. We've every every scratch golfer's played five better than a handicap someday, but we we haven't a chance to do it when it counts. But the thing is, well, you've had a chance at a level and yeah, haven't done it. Yeah. That's the level you finished at. And you knew then that day, didn't you? That's what I'm saying. Jill, you didn't need a coach to tell you you can't make it. You knew instinctively for four hours. I don't even like this. I'm not enjoying this. I'm not comfortable here at all. I'm out of my depth. And I'll gradually, I'll just, I'll just slide away from that. You know, maybe not under a tournament or complain it's about it. It's, it's not even one particular moment. It's, it's like a, a range. Like you, you know yourself. You feel yourself getting better and better and better. And then you look at the level you're at and you see 30 people in front of you and you go, right, mm. Right, let's. Uh, there's a there's a brilliant there's a brilliant, 
there's a brilliant saying in that movie star thing your man Lando said uh, the road puts you in your place uh, I lost a couple of seats so get a, that's why you, I know you we all land different places about how honest you be with students and how hard you be on them but and your personality has to fit that you have to be authentic when you're either being critical of the person giving feedback. but the game puts you in your place it'll tell you where you're at when when don't you take the, some of those really good ladies to like british opens and stuff like that you know that'll put them in their place now maybe it's funny, someone... though, it's funny though, i did a thing with uh i, I did a chat with two players now already right for like <clears throat> this little warrior code thing that i'm doing it's all about this stuff it's like you know the code that you play by and the codes that you, you train by when you talk to any player about their best performances, it's rarely like it's rarely the technical work they did in the range mm -hmm. that morning or the day before. It's like like one of the girls, Nicole, she finished second in Canada last year and she played with Jin Young Ko, the world number one, and Brooke Henderson in Canada on the last day. And she said the biggest thing was um two two things. She said one, she spoke to David her own coach and, and she was like he said, look, it doesn't matter whether you win tomorrow. Tomorrow matters that you go out and you play a good round and you finish off the tournament well and you be yourself. And then the second thing, she, she got in front of them every day of that week. She would, she would go in front of the mirror in the locker room before going to practice and tell herself in Danish, so nobody, nobody knew what she was saying, but in Danish she was like, like, you're enough. You're good enough. You belong here. This is where you want to be. Like, go out, be yourself, have fun, and let's do this, right? Not like, it's not like oh, <clears throat> when you get to the top, bow your wrist. That's what's important today. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, so when you come to like, if the mental piece is the next frontier, performance is the next frontier, is we will start to pay much greater attention to how do we perform? What goes into the performance piece? How can we train for a performance? Like, like if we all look at, if we all look at all the lessons we've done over the last 10 years, right? What percentage of the lessons were truly based around getting the best performance out of the player? And what percentage of lessons were based around getting the best technique out of the player or making things look better? What well, comes to your belief, you sort of sometimes you think, uh, is it the technique helps the belief or is it the belief helps the technique? That's a chicken and egg scenario. It's probably a mixture of both, you know, mm. um, again, because I listened to Matt Wallace yesterday, he said something real interesting that he was playing the Alps tour, um, blah, 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 comes to the last hole, feels really strong, mentally perfect, out of bounds, right? He's like, that wasn't me mental, that was the technique. But Joe, I just so I, made, I made a decision there, he says, I made a decision that I was going to make my technique much better, so it didn't happen. Now again, that's his opinion, it's not based on science, but he said, I felt mentally strong. You know, now we all know he seems to be a mentally strong golfer. Um, so is it the technique? Is it the mental side? Or is it vice versa? And that's the thing to work out on a player-by-player -player basis, I suppose. But see, see I, I, I listened to that too. John, I've heard that before. So I'll ask you two this question, right? If that's the technique, how do you get there with a four-shot lead? I know the technique let him down because mentally he thought he was perfect. He probably was. But yeah. it's the technique under that duress. It's not the technique's fault. It's not he could go tomorrow and shoot sixty five on his home course. Yeah. It's the technique under that duress, surely. It can't it's just be probably how he, it's probably how he perceives his technique as yeah. well. You know, his technique in the whole scheme of things was was very good. Yeah. It just wasn't Had up to his standard. Yeah. You know, he it wasn't as if he swung yeah. it like an octopus. I so maybe it, it was the technique, but that's in context, surely, of the position he's in. And Dave Alred spoke with this or was it a said, said this the other day. Last he was like, there's no <laughs> correlation between great preparation and great performances. He was yeah. like, so there's no guarantee because you hit it well in practice, you're going to hit it well in the tournament. He said, often yeah. there is some studies suggest that like struggling in your practice, in your preparation, will lead to better performances because what it does is the way it affects the brain is it, it, it makes the brain a little bit more aware of the threat. So the brain is a little bit more focused. And I spoke, was chatting to one of the guys yesterday, and she was like, when she has a hole that she's nervous about on a tournament week, she tends to hit it down the middle every single time. So the tougher the hole she's shitting herself over, she hits it well because... That's a skill there. It focuses, it makes her really, like, zone in. And if she gets a wide fairway, she's goosed. 
here, you guys will like this one here. It's exactly what you've said there, Donald. Um, I remember speaking to Graham Walker in Abu Dhabi, and he said whatever he had worked with Willett and Paul Waring and maybe all a few or three or four real good players, and then won a few times. And he said that every week that won, when he left, and the words he used were they were always on edge. The game wasn't quite there. They were a little, <laughs> little bit edgy on a Wednesday night, out looking for a little bit of something. But and he said he didn't mind that because the next day he their expectations are not high, and they know we're going to have to battle. And also, if you think about it, even if you start ultra confident, you can't really go that far from there. But they can go from mid. Now I'm sure plenty of middle of the roads went down, but middle of the roads went up, and then by Sunday they're actually and they're confident. probably. They're probably shitting themselves. They could lose it at any minute. So they're like, oh, "Fuck! Yeah. Right, come on, let me go." Like, like I know we're doing well here, but we got to stay focused. Yeah. And how many, like, even even ourselves, like how many times are you on the edge about your coaching or you're a bit worried? You nearly do your best job. Yeah, Stephen you know, Hood said or, something. Once, you know, Stephen Hood said something once. Are you better to be confident or competent? Because a lot of people are very good and not that confident. Some people are confident and not actually very good. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you come back to that results piece. You're better to be competent because that shows you you're getting a result. Um, or you, you look, you listen to Roy Kings. These people, a lot of them are riddled with self doubt. Brando Driscoll. Or if you, or if you look at them, if you go back to coaching and you're like, <clears throat> if, if if that on the edge piece is where, was, and like obviously you don't want to be too far on the edge yeah. in terms of like I'm just on the ledge here and I'm, yeah on the ledge <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you want to be on the edge not on the ledge but yeah. like like in, in, in if we're really trying to get players to perform we should really be trying to push them to that edge as much as possible in training so that like they can sample it and bring it into their next performances as opposed to wrapping them in cotton wool and going yeah just tell you what like that looks really good so how you're striking mm. great it's perfect 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 the, dif the difficulty for us isn't it that a lot of people don't like being on the edge because that's uncomfortable and people don't like discomfort we don't like discomfort so how do you Take a junior or his first introduction to the game, help him fall in love with the game, build the romance, the fun, the high fives, and then slowly ebb it towards more discomfort until him. Ideally, don't know, would you want it? If you had that uh, alternate player, would you want them? Maybe you maybe would want all their comfort, all their practice done with as high a training simulation as possible when the time comes to them, you know, just in life, what they're doing. Would you want that up? You know, like the Marine or the, what do they say, special forces, just train, 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 and then go to mission. Train, 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 you know. It's like it's like everything though. You can't, uh, you can't, you can't learn resilient. Like you can't learn. This moving other to the other day. You can't learn resilience. You have to experience it. So it's yeah. like you can't mm. learn resilience through reading a book. You have to. You can only learn resilience through experience it, surviving it. So, you. So I guess like if you had that player, you, like the other thing as well though, right? Is like those top players, like they're top because they love to compete. Yeah. So I I find like I find. The more, like, even with bet, the best players I've worked with, the more competitive I make the practice, the more they fucking get a buzz on for it. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, it's like the, it's, like, it's almost like they tolerate the, they tolerate the bit of technical skills work to get to the competitive practice. And that's the same as what would be in every sport. Sometimes I don't think that they actually love the game. They just love the competitiveness. Mm. You know, it's just something in installed in them that the whatever it was whether it's walking to the end of the road or playing a football match or rugby or whatever it's like and i think sometimes we like I, I i know i've fallen into this before but like i find coaching performance sometimes a bit uncomfortable because you see them struggling and you're like and you can see them going through emotion and you're kind of sitting there and you're going like, oh, fuck, like, Jesus Christ. And you ever just like, like when we get through this and how are they going to be afterwards? Da -la -la -la. So I'm I've kind of, I've kind of, I've kind of geared the sessions away from it. Whereas now I've, I've gone to a certain degree, I'm going to like, go, go is back. The skill of coach, is the skill of coaching in that scenario, Donald, probably not worrying about what you've done, but how to evaluate it to the player after. So hmm. they're in tears, they're uncomfortable, you're uncomfortable going, you know, you it's a little bit high, but. It's the, the skill is actually getting them la leaving this the scene, understanding what what you've done. Exactly, yeah, and that's like that's been a couple of my best sessions. Have definitely been where you've really put a like brought a player through a tough session. You've gone in there with some good like okay, well here's our here's our the goal of performance, but here's the behaviours I want to exhibit. And then afterwards you do the reflection. You're like, what did you learn from that? Oh, fuck, like I'm glad I 
I really stuck at it and I learned from that one previous one, I got the next one and da 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 da. Like like think of the way the best think of the way like say like some of the best team coaches have coached their teams. Like I've heard like the, the, the toughest matches that some of the all blacks have played is like when they're playing the bees. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Well even go back, go back to the old days, Raymond Floyd and Ravino playing for money. Yeah. You know, money games when really they didn't have it or they they needed it. So, you know, that has to be they were doing that contextual training themselves back then. And you know here's another one I was talking about the other day. One thing that happened to players in the past was having to collect your own golf balls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because you would practice, you could only do it for twenty five minutes because you'd hit them all. And then you'd have to you would go to, and as you're going to collect them, your brain is working through what you're practicing on. And then you go back and do it again. Whereas then now, yeah, sorry, don't go. For yeah, whereas now we have ranges, and like you, you hit your balls on the range. You can like you can get another book, another book, another book. Your brain never really switches off, and then you don't have the downtime of having because the best thing about having to go collect the golf balls, you had a bag in one hand and a club in the other, so you couldn't be looking at your phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now they go like focus, 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 and then they they never allow their brain the time to switch off because you go straight onto your phone and focus on something else, you know. Yeah. Do you know another thing we, no, I haven't mentioned yet? Like we are talking from our perspective. Think of the people we're going to be coaching. You've got a group of people who are the smartest they've ever been, the most well-connected they've ever been, but they've got shorter, not attention spans. They just don't, it puts them off to think there's going to be a 10-minute or 20-minute team talk. They like, things <laughs> done, they like things done in small nuggets where it's maybe visible and it's cool. Hence the reason we see a lot of our contemporaries or like they're like personalities as much as actually knowledge beds now they actually sell the the sell the experience as much as they sell whereas we would have driven to Bobby Brown or if you could have got a lesson with Bob Horn she would you know, we and it wouldn't yeah it would have been an experience but it would have been cool high five whereas now a lot of the coaching they're now evolving into like an ex, a coaching experience so we're dealing we'll, 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 we'll have a different type of person to coach in ten years as well or five years it takes more for somebody now to be like excited because they get more from the fact of yeah. Like Bob Torrance would have seen like a myth to us, say maybe yeah, so going over the stadium would have been unreal. The, the, the life of myths isn't as much because you can see Rory online, yeah. you can get a context of what he does, or even these super a list singers or whatever it is. You know, you nearly, you, I suppose, as a young person, it, we're all we were all impressionable as young people, but we will maybe seen Sevy on TV once a month. Yeah, you, know, you can see a Sevy's equivalent online every day now. Think, and you can contact them. Yeah. Think about this. Think, yeah, think about think about this situation right now. Imagine what you what us three would have paid eight nine years ago, right? To go to a seminar where you would get to see and learn from 20, 30 of the best golf coaches in the world, right? Or or if you could buy a DVD. Imagine if you could buy a, a pack of DVDs with a one-hour interview with the 20, 30 best coaches in the world. And now we can hop onto YouTube after the last two weeks and there's yeah. probably 60 hours of the best coaches in the world talking about their, their ideas and their principles for free. I don't know. So, like, so like that's going to be a, that's, that's a complete, like, paradigm shift altogether where... Yeah. Access to information has never been easier, freer, and more available. And that's, so does, where, that's, that's where now having the information is not going to be setting you apart as a golf coach. 100%. Yeah, the you know, it's, what, what, it's what extra. Is it then another point I have in the mind? Sorry, Johnny, was right, is, right. is it keeping it so personal, being so personable, being like a, not like a life coach, I wouldn't say, but like, I'm not being like a. Com the, 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 the kids now are bombarded with so much information. Having the information is not going to be the skill anymore. It's how you interpret that information, how you pass it off, how you treat the player will probably be much more, not much more important. It's important as it is now, but it could be different. The coaching teams, you're not going to have a true player on tour who doesn't have a coaching team. It's that's, the, you know, that's the craft of coaching, but that's what, yeah, I, that's what yeah, we're, in, we're interested yeah, in that craft yeah. of how as you said, Joe, it's the, the information is not going to be. But I look at it a little bit like food, right? Because if you go on to Google now, right, you can type in anything and it'll give you a recipe how to cook it. Yeah. yeah. Yet they're still top chefs. Yeah, yeah. 
and yeah. the difference between the top interpretation is how, exactly so it's going to be the, the reason the, the, the softer skills are going to be the big things where it's going to be like okay well look you know all the information in the world's out there right but i have got this unique human in front of me with all these different shit going on like like you know all these different things and then i have i have to help them figure out what's their unique recipe for great performance yeah evolving and, and progressing and growing and getting better and that's the ultimate skill of coaching you know and that's going to become even more and more and more and more important it's like nearly like seasoning like you never see a chef measuring out seasoning but you know, you know, do, you know what, do you know what too about dono i agree it's it's funny what we said the other day about the the, the marginal one percenters the 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 human skills are that will set you apart if you know the technology and have the information yeah do you know what i mean so it's like you can't for you can't be mother Teresa with no golf knowledge that will yeah, last yeah. You. yeah so i don't know which comes first maybe the maybe you have all the human skills and you go and learn the information or maybe you have all the information and technology and then you learn but you need both so it'll only be a separator if you have the other one yeah you'll, need, you'll probably need both you need both. I wasn't suggesting that you need one or the other. You need, I think you need techno technological skills to become level with everybody and then set yeah. yourself apart. You know, it's like many years coaching do we have between ourselves? 30 odd. You know, and we're still looking, I'm still on here two hours every night trying to learn about what I want to learn next about 3D. Don't know, you're on. I'm sure two hours every night learning about something else. Johnny, you're the same. So it's, it's you're always trying to, you know yourself what you've got to learn, I suppose. It, 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 was, it was like a, Nathan asked me the other day when was that Instagram live thing. He was like, oh, you know, like a great way to work with good players now through specialization. I was like, yeah, but the problem is, right, if you're, if you're, if you're specializing to work with great players, it'll never work out for you because the, the, uh, the, the the goal behind it isn't actually to learn about the specialization you're just using it as a vehicle and i was like truthfully the best specialists i believe start out from a position of wit so they have a good wide base of knowledge which allows Generally. them to go deep as opposed to if you go really deep and narrow if anything comes out of your field you're you're, you're in trouble it's kind of like why in medical school you have to go through general before you pick your specialism do you get me and yeah, i think like I think in well, coaching you know. In coaching, you should be like in coaching. You should have, uh, like you said, Johnny. You should be like real. The wider you can make your breadth of experience and study, the more likely it is you'll be able to connect the dots. It's like you know, you reading Frank Sinatra's uh, autobiography, me watching the documentary about the hip hop people. You pull shit out of that that you can apply right. day to day in your own coaching. One of the things I was going to say about that, and maybe I'm drawn to this, or sometimes you've got bias, and you just, if you want to buy a red car, you see red cars. But when I, like the books I've read, so after I recently, Byron McGuigan, Mike Tyson, they mega talents like Roberto Duran, but they have such messed up, uneven lives. They, like a lot of them abuse, like you're snapped a drink and he abused his talent, but he's still shone at a level nobody could. It's amazing, like, whereas what we want as a coach, we search for these, we unearth, unearth these diamonds, and you want them to be perfect, but the very nature of those diamonds, are, they're sometimes, that's very hard, you know, that, you, like, you finally get what you want, and it, isn't, it, isn't, it won't do what you want. And I think and another it, thing with the way lifestyle is at the minute, everything's so instant, there's no fast track to ultimate success. You know, if you try and look forward 10 years, it seems so far away, but if you look back 10 years, it's not that long ago. I don't know, Joe, there's a girl in Calvin around the four minute mile there. <laughs> <laughs> she, well, ran the, she ran the four minute mile five times in a row. She ran the four minute mile three minutes, and she's no history of running in the family. <laughs> she's only got one leg. Um, right, you're, you're, right. Right. you're right, Chris. The, the other side, the other side of it is, too, is as Johnny said, it's like you know, they're like, oh, they all have such messed up lives. Or, like we all have such messed up uh, lives. What's you know normal? What I mean? There's no, there's no there's normal. No, there's no normal, and it's like even the. Uh, the whole the whole nature of it was like the the uh that was the thing about the defiant ones your man jimmy Ivey, the producer like he just let them be he was like like yeah they're they're getting in trouble they're doing all this stuff but that's like you're working with geniuses here you have to give them the freedom to be geniuses right so so right okay so take that who's brave enough here as a coach to be working maybe you've been introduced to like this phenom and you see all these things that are that doesn't make sense but who's brave enough to say maybe that's why they're good 
you know what I mean? Maybe going out having a party with their mates, maybe, you know, like telling them they're brilliant. You think that's totally false confidence. Maybe that's why it's, you know, yourself, you sometimes you've got to step back and think, well, what actually works here before? Because we as idealists want to go in and start thinking, well, if you're good now, wait till I get a hold of you. And sometimes well, you can mess some, up the some, secret sauce. Sometimes that's the fact of sitting back and actually watching what's happening and getting a lie of the land rather than going in head first and giving in your ideas. See yeah. what they do. First, yeah. and then you can make your own judgments on it. But yeah, that, that, takes, that, that takes time to get in there because we all want. Oh, we're so excited to get in there. We all want to rush in at the start. But the other side of it is too, though, is everything works until it doesn't work. So, like for example, yeah, you, you get this phenom, and well, your job then is to go. Well, like if you're winning every turn, if you're winning every tournament you pitch up on, brilliant. Keep doing what you're doing. Let's let's try and win by more. Our job isn't actually to win tournaments anymore. We're winning by two at the minute. Our job is to win by five. If they're not winning tournaments though under Fino, then what you've got to do is you've got to find the, the opportunity to identify the pieces that are, are stopping them from winning. And then get you're almost like for Fino, you're sometimes just clearing shit out of the way. Ah, yeah. You know what I mean? Well, is, your, is your first job with a Fino just not to, not to mess it up or make it worse? You know, that's your first job. Yeah, well, the first job with a Fino is to get a contract. Very clearly signed. <laughs> Here, have you watched that fact, that thing on YouTube, the roundtable talk with Tiger's team? No, no. Oh, it's out. It's, no. it's always on Golf Pass. So, Mark. Ste I finally heard Mark Steinberg's voice and Joey Lacava and your man, the practice partner. Um, Twenty-five minutes. It's, it's it's made for TV, but it's worth interesting. Anyway, why am I saying that? Because the practice partner, the guy hits with him, says. If you overdo anything the Tiger, nobody lasts. If you overdo the arrangements, if you overdo the coaching, if you overdo anything, you go. So it's like all you gotta, you got you gotta get into his lane. The ball, the ball guy. He's a uh, uh, Ryan McNamara. The point I'm making is, yeah. Tiger obviously has his stuff going. Even though what you think about, it, he has his stuff going the way he wants. You've got to get in, and as you would expect yourself, but it's like you've got to work around them. They don't have to uh, work around you. You know, they're, you're there for a reason to try. They, they have put trust in you to help them get better. You know, it's it's going back to the fact of knowing your job, doing your job well, and not doing someone else's. Yeah. As as Mike Ebron said, that golden bit of advice: uh, give them what they want and slip in what they need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, but, 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 how, how many times have we said that, lads? Butch said that or night. Get them to be or let better. Make sure it's their idea. I mean, we've been saying that. And we probably heard that better say that ten years ago, but it's so true, isn't it? But that takes time. You're dropping hints. You're you're you're. Oh, we just happened to be at the, like they say last night. Tiger won't work at his bunker play. Joey said he'll stick a full basket of balls in the bunker. Woods will hit six and leave. He said they're always on to him. Come on, do some more bunker play. But he, you know, he just uh, wants to do something else. But it's like you, you just find yourself in the bunker. Oh look, here's a bunker. You get a <laughs> shot. How many times you done that? You know, you know yourself. Oh. Oh, show me that shot again. Well, you're brilliant. That shot just anything to get him to hit. Yeah, and he, may, Tiger, maybe even sees that as I'm wasting time in the bunker. If I go and practice something else, the the, the positive influence of that may outweigh the positive yeah. influence in a better bunker play. Yeah, yeah. You know, and even so, just, even that even that clip of I think that is is that his practice partner, the one I sent of the yeah. higher and lower one. Yes, I think even even that clip shows why that guy's probably stuck around. It's because Tiger hits a flat one and he goes, "Ah, oh, like you're gonna have to do better than that if you're gonna impress these guys. You're gonna have to hit it high off that." Like, and yeah. it's like he's probably just tapped into. I'm not gonna try to do much bar challenge him. And Tiger yeah. eats it up. Yeah. Same as Michael Jordan. The easiest way to get Michael Jordan to do something is tell him he can't do it. Yeah, that's what Butch said about. Well, think about our lives, lads. If you if you get a chance, whatever it is, the scenario you're in, and not you're exposed, but you, you, you were showing up a bit in the shortcoming, you would go back and work like hell at that shortcoming. You wouldn't need, you wouldn't need a mentor, you wouldn't need a psychology book, you'd need anything. That would burn you, it would hurt, and you'd go back and make sure that pain wasn't there again. Yeah, yeah. And well, that's, that's going back to Dave Allred's uh, point about you can't learn resilience. Yeah. You, you experience it. But, but Jill, wait, surely I said this to, to Carla, I think, and we're all guilty, we sometimes rob students of chances to, ex to be exposed to resilience. You know, we as, because maybe you're, you're a bit under pressure from a parent, you've got to make ends meet, you're trying to run a business, you take those chances away from people to let them, let them suffer a little bit. Because we know from our experience, as long as it doesn't go in too psychologically deep, they're, they're very, very powerful learning opportunities for people. 
when you really are faced with your own thoughts and you think, right, is this going to do? Or who am I bluffing here? You know, you're, all of us can thrive off experiences where we've been hurt, but it's made us a better coach six yeah. months down the line. And it's, it's, and it's just, it's like anything, it's not easy getting those knocks. No. But when you look back, when you look back on it, you understand that it needed to happen. It wasn't like yeah. you're glad it's happened. Nobody's glad to be put under scrutiny at all. But it's, it's helped that it's happened, you know. We sat here, lads, and wrote down for five minutes our five biggest lessons. I bet none of them came from, from something somebody told you or a book you read. It'll be from an experience you had that you messed it up. You had to get back, self-reflect, look at yourself, come out of a better version. And that was painful. But you're now a much stronger, better, and it gives you perspective. You think, okay, I've been through this before. I can deal with it. It's just going to take time. But all, all I bet you, all of us, because we're all similar types of people in that regard, reflective and want to do better. It'll all be about an experience. We made a mistake, misjudgment, or we retreated badly and we learned from it. Not be about this, the third principle and your mind, Stephen Cubby's seven management skills of highly effective people. You know what I mean? It'll be. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be something that had an emotional resonance with you. Something that like brought out an emotion in you that caused you to yeah. change your behavior in some way. But also, like, like when, a, when when a player decides not to work with you anymore, and you get a yeah. sense of why they decided, you can be guaranteed that that you'll never let that get in the way of a coaching relationship again. And it's the same as like, you know, I think if you ask, uh, it's funny if you ask players, like you ask them, like, can you can you give me an example of? when you like really feel like you, you, you had a tough, you were in a tough spot and you overcame it. Um, it's really interesting the answers you get. Like it's, it, it's usually like maybe mid round they give themselves a talking to or they have a really bad tournament and, get, and it's so bad that they have to like confront the demon eventually yeah. and battle it. Yeah. And then they come up, they over, a bit, like they wrestle with it and they overcome it and they go, you know, and, and the, the demon is never as strong again after they have that battle with it. And it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier about the, uh, and I, I've a thought on this, but like a lot of the times when you ask people the best shots they hit in the round, a lot of the time it's a, like, okay, so it's a great shot, but sometimes it's a shot either that they so exceed their expectation of yeah. the shot that they remember, or they were in huge trouble and played an unbelievable recovery. And how many players have you had that said, do you know what, like I'm stuck behind a tree, I can hit, I can hit. I can always get out of it, but sometimes we're in the middle of the fairway, I'm dreadful. I know, yeah. I remember Hart Dennis saying that to me about an Irish thing. He said, sometimes the hardest chips are the ones up, the, the flat grain to your back then, because you've got 20 options. I know. Or you have to land and do this and all. It's just, there, there, there in lies the importance of making good decisions, when the decision's made for you. Hence, I've watched Darren Clark and Billy Foster, and Billy Foster just tells him what shot to play, but it takes a decision making away from Darren Clark at that time. And that, uh, so he must, he then can commit to it 100%. Maybe he doesn't trust his own judgment at that time, but yeah, that, that decision making piece. Um, and maybe that's what made Tiger so good was that, like, he was so clear in the visual of every shot that he wanted to hit. There wasn't a huge bailout for him. It was like, this is exactly what I want to happen, and I know exactly what that looks like. Whereas some players, like, do you know what? Kind of, uh, yeah. this would be okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's no no need for doubt, really. I suppose to say, like if you're, like you wouldn't want Lewis Hamilton to be doubting a takeover when he's about to do it. You know, no. if you make a decision and you go for it, you back yourself and you trust yourself, and that's generally, generally, not all the time, when the best performances come out. I heard, I heard a brilliant thing there in one of Rotella's books. We all know. Now we've gone off topic here a bit, but we all know about playing in the wind. How difficult that is, especially in RC side wins. And, and uh, provided it's not wide, so let's say a 15, 20 man or win, a couple of clubs, maybe three at most. He said wind tests two things, your ability to strike the ball purely and your commitment to the shot. And you know that when you get slightly uncommitted to a shot in the wind, it is horrific sometimes. But when you're committed and you go, and you and that just as a big, big resistance to your commitment. And you know if you go for your shot and hit it, it's so rewarding to hit like a four iron through the wind onto the green as you know you had to go for your shot, you had to hit it properly. Like we haven't had discussion before, Johnny, about uh, players in the wind. Oh, the wind took that. Aye. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. You, 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 don't skill. you don't know the skills. You don't know the skills. I've started this winter, especially when it gets so windy and people saying, is there any point in practicing in the wind? I've started, that's the most important time to practice. What did Matt Walsh? 
it's the wind has got the least. It's, it's the it's got the least room for error. So if yeah. your ball is going well in the wind, imagine what it's going to be like when there's no wind. Yeah, it's going to That's be pure, and you're going to be strong, and you're going to be stronger over the ball. Yeah. That's why juniors, I think, don't like the wind because it exposes. It's like in us. It's like maybe it's like that me teaching with a guy teaching a track man beside me. I don't like it because I'm scared of it. That it's going to know more than me, and I know it knows more than me because it's, I don't have track man at all. But said he's got two track man, one there and one there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 it's on down the line. <laughs> <laughs> you can get away with that when you're retired with ninety million in the bank. <laughs> You get away with that and you forget who won the 14th major you worked with. <laughs> we have, we're, we're going to the open and going to the, we're, we're going to the, uh, one of the merchandise tent by and everything. But just get home with a trophy and the flag. And we're by the flags and everything. And they can't remember who won it last year. Uh, what, was that, did I work with Stuart Singh? Oh, that's right, I forgot. <laughs> but you're right. So you, you fit, and we all do as coaches too. Nobody better than us to, to critique other coaches' philosophies because a lot you don't know anything about them really mm-hmm. and you're potentially I don't say scared, they unnerve you a bit in case they know something you don't. A bit vulnerable. Yeah, and that, that we know all that deep down. But again that, that then is designed to get you to take action to do something to learn about that or to whatever, you know. Cause usually like like I think we said this before, but there's usually uh Anybody that you, anybody that you, you, you have the, the sense you want to like critique and criticize is because the thing you want to critique and criticize is the thing you feel most vulnerable about yourself. <laughs> You're like, ah, uh, lad, fucking, and that thief bag up there didn't give him a seminar, was he? You no, know? and you're like, well, no. because more than me, it. more than me, exactly, <laughs> more than me. Look what your man's charging. How does he get away with that? He can't. We should be charging more to also <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> Yeah. Why did your man? And that's and like that's the man uh, Steve Astle last night says, "Don't look over. Don't don't you you you're not advertising to yourself. You're advertising to other people." I was like, I was saying to, it's, but again, that's where uh, if, if if we look at ourselves as coaches and the players we work with, like I was saying, Nicole's on the she went down on the tour first. She was kind of looking around a wee bit, like, "Oh, look, you know, that's what you know, like, what do they do?" And it's like it's got to be it's got to be like inspiration, not imitation. So it's like. I can never, I can never coach like you coach, and I can never coach like Jenny coach. Can never coach like much harder coaches. I can, but I can take inspiration from some of the stuff that you guys do. But I can never, but I, I should never try and imitate it. Same way as like, if if we were, if we, if we look at, I think about it this way, right? If we look at the players that we coach and we try and get them to do the same things that other players do, we're doing them a disservice because then they could never be yeah. better than the players that we're trying yeah. to get them to do the same things as. Well, well, it's, it's, like, like the old, it's like the old adage about the two averages, and then someone turns around and goes, "I don't want to be average." Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh man, uh, I, I didn't mean it that way. Yeah. <laughs> well, think think about this here, lads. Right. So, if we go back this direction, the coaching industry is going, and it's, it's going to be more and more performance led because that's what the rewards are. You, if you get a if you get a kid or a junior or a mini tour player or whatever, you do see what they do. And my, I'd be like, I'd be saying, right, it's not about what Jordan Spieth does. Or I know seventy percent leads the stats here, and Dustin Johnson does it that long. But can you can you get what you do to a world class level? If you can, stick at it. If you can't, then you need to change slash improve. It's like do, you need to do. If you're an unbelievable chipper, you need to chip in a way, and your game has to support it to get to a world class. It's not it's not about how you do it. It's the destination you get to, and it's just for shooting for that destination. You know. So like, can you can you arrange what you do at a world class level? If you can't, then you need to change. Or and I spoke I spoke to, I spoke to Mark about this, and this is like I think we've you know, um, I think we've got stats. I think well, I know I have. I think we've got stats backwards. I think we've been messing it up the whole time. <clears throat> I think we've been so busy collecting stats, we were never actually using them to empower the players in the moment. So instead of actually being so worried about collecting the data, we should be going having the players going out pursuing the data instead. So, so, for example, right? So, for example, uh, we like say I, I have a controversial. One. I don't think strokes gained is that helpful because okay, somebody collects it, does their, their stats, and they go right. Well, a, a negative strokes gained approach. Okay, now what? Not actionable. You too, can't. Too you can't vague. Trade. Too vague. <clears throat> you can't like you tell somebody go out, okay tomorrow. Tomorrow, I want you to go and you want to be. I want you to be strokes gained around the green. Now, yeah. 
you tell somebody, however, you tell somebody to go out and you go, right, tomorrow, I want five birdies. I want you to have seven approach shots inside 20 feet. And I want you to have a, a four and a half score, an average of the par five, so you're going to have to birdie two, par, par the other two. And if you do that, that, that those are the that, based on all the data we have, that's the kind of performance that leads to a 68 or 69. And you're going to have to do that over, in, it, in and around there for four rounds to win this tournament. It's much simpler that as well. It's so much simple. Simpler. So simple. The guys can go out and actually. Is that, like, is that based? Is that based? Oh yes, on the like blackjacks and the and the effective greens and. So I thought. Was, I think that's a genius. That's also so simple. Ultimately, it's based on having actionable stats that a player can go after. You know this. Like we, I think we've all been lulled into this thing of. I think we've all been lulled into this thing of. Um, uh, you have to be in the present, and not think about your score, right? And that kind of leaves people flapping about in the wind. I think, like, I think you should have. I think you sh you should have a score that you want to shoot. I think you should have a strategy that will deliver that score, and then be in the moment then and each and every time you chase it. And I think the key to add into that: if you achieve it, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. Yeah, accept it. Get on to next you a, you a, you, you, You're good enough. You'll do it at some stage. You ask, ask, ask any. I would love to go round right and and ask all the players at, a, at an Irish amateur level, say boys, right, and go, how many birdies on average do you think the top US, because so, like, let's say we say the top 10 US college players who are likely to be in the top 50 in the world, how many birdies on average do you think they have around? How many bogeys on average do you think they have around? How many times do you reckon they hit it inside 20 feet around? How many greens did they hit? What do you think the scramble on average would be? I would love to see the answers that come back. And I guarantee you they would have a clue. Uh, the as we wouldn't, they have, wouldn't have a clue, as we wouldn't have had before. No. We were there. So we should have we should have our players going out and going right. Today's today. I want you to get you your job. If it's going to be low scored, your job is to chase down eight birdies inside twenty feet. That's your goal. I want you to have uh, your goal is to have no more than one three foot. That's stuff that they can take onto the course and action. Not us look back on ten rounds later and go, oh well, we fucked up yeah. that again. Do you know well, what I mean? I, 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 I suppose you got to look back at this pandemic to learn for the next one. So you need to do. You do need to collect daily. Maybe you just have to use it better, or use what you've gathered and bring it into real time right there and then. So if this happened again in two years, you could be very quick to you respond. Mean, you only know about the number of birdies the college player makes or number inside eight feet of previous data collected. It's just, it's yeah. just it goes back to the interpretation and the delivery of the data. It's but not imagine, the actual data that's the problem. It's the but imagine, right, imagine how easy it would be to get players to collect stats if they had three or four key goals every round to go and get. Imagine if, you, imagine if your only job was, right, what's my, what's my KPIs at the minute? In positions, scrambling, and uh, birdies. Then you need just to track that for course, You need to take in course difficulty. If you get a like a British Am and it's high on 45 miles per hour and they've hit 12 greens and none inside 20 feet, then you couldn't again, critique. Again, though, that's that's where that's where adaptability comes in. That's where you get to you go, you go to a rhythm and you're like, okay, well, the goal this week isn't on birdies, it's on it's a bogeys. It's actually right. Well, the goal this week is have no more than three bogeys around. Mm -hmm. And then they go out with that strategy. And how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to have to, but instead of trying to hit it inside 20 feet, the goal is going to be to try and get 14 greens and reg per round. Because then I only need to get up and down one out of the other four to have a chance of keeping my bogey strategy. Whereas instead, what we would do is leave them off. They just go out and they play. They get whatever score they get. And then they come back over and we look at the stats and go, yeah, you too many bogeys. You know, or maybe we do that, anyway. but like that's what I think we've done. I think I think we've done it backwards the whole time. I think, well, I, think go, I think you can go way, way, way too deep, and some as a player or look back whenever I play, that would some stats would help me, and some would actually hurt. Yeah, and it's normal ones are right and wrong for you, and um, and how to interpret them. Do you need it simple? Do you need it real detail? It comes back to the human. Everybody's different. How many how many under the cut do you think you need to be to win a PGA Tour event? Oh, that's that game four stuff, isn't it? That's yeah. very interesting. You need to be f four a day under it, something like that there, is that right? 16 under the cut. Yeah, so, like, yeah. so, or the other one was, the other fascinating one there was the word told me was like, a guy was going to web.com and he contacted him, I think he was a challenger, Black Over Here or something, contacted him, he goes, go to web.com, 
what what do I need to shoot to get my card? And he said, uh, 18 under. And he was like, what, 18 under? And he goes, well, yeah, well, like, you know, some, at least one or two players every year go over 18 under. So that means that you have to shoot 18 under minimum to win, which means that you have to be trying to shoot 18 under to get your card. Because if, you, if you're going to, to qualify, you'll probably be on the qualifier bubble. So do you know your man shot? 18 under. Mm-hmm. third. He shot exactly <laughs> that number. And, and, and it's like, and even Harrington said it as well. He was like, uh, his big mistake early in his career was that he was always prepared for Thursday morning instead of Sunday afternoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. So, like, like we should, like, like I don't, I've always, maybe I've been a bit wrong with that, but maybe, like, you know, having, having, working back from what you need to do to achieve your goal, it's, it sounds so simple, but, like, if the goal is to win the tournament, yeah, well, if you yeah. need to be 16 under. So, like, what well, do we yeah, that's the same, Donald, as that the, all the data that Chris said, you, re, you look back retrospectively and then use it. Basically, 70% plus scrambling to win on the PGA Tour. So if you're aiming for, I know you would do it incrementally, but ultimately you want the top of the mountain to be 71%. Yeah. Because you wouldn't want it to get sick. You've got to think, well, I'm only at 30 now and I want to get to 40, but ultimately at some point in eight years, I've got to try and get to 70%. Or maybe it'll move, <laughs> might even have moved on by then. It might even have just been gradually the tide could have gone up and like I like the other thing the really interesting thing there was and this is where I was wrong I was like oh well you know that might explain why some lads go straight from college to the PGA Tour and do well and he was like we were on a bit scrambling and how sc- scrambling is one of the it takes it's the hardest one to shift it takes a long time to move the curve upwards to get me in your percentages and he was like it also explains why and this is an interesting one is like when you when guys go to college the, the ball striking is usually really, really good. Like they're up at 13, 14, 15 greens and rag around the best uh-huh. case. So imagine if, you, if you're a real good ball striker, Johnny, right? And you're hitting on average 14, 15 greens around. Let's say your scramble was a bag of shit. You only miss three greens. You get up about yeah. once. You only make two bogeys. You made five birdies. You shot 69. You won the tournament. So he was like, the problem is these guys go out onto the PGA Tour and the courses get 400 yards longer. The rough gets thicker. And even the best guys hit 12 and a half greens around. So now they're missing six greens. Yeah. And they're, and, and, and they're, and they're uh, scrambling. They never worked on it because they never had to. And all of a sudden, now their they're scrambling rates are 40% and they've lost their cards. Yeah. And it's yeah. the guys that can hit it and scramble. But the hard part is, kind of like the Tiger thing, is if a guy doesn't need it, you have to convince him to work on it. And that's where you use yeah. the data. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, the, the as you say, I, let's you ask better questions. The stats are like a mirror because if you hold it up to them, it's who they are in black and white. You know, and, it, and it, you can't run from that. And it's like a, it, 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 you know, it, it's kind of like a, it's a, it's a vehicle to help to drive you forward as well because you can look at it as like, oh, it, you know, all the stats tell me is like, there's things some shit out. I don't want to know. No, it's, yeah. the stats are, the stats are the vehicle to drive you forward. It's like, Lewis Hamilton doing a lap time, like he has to hit a certain time, like you can pretend all you want, but if he doesn't do those yeah. first three splits, then yeah. forget about it. There's a very good idea what that time is before the start. Yeah. I think, lads, we, you, we introduce stats to from 14 to 22 year olds. They're not used to being measured in so many ways, whereas we are used to being measured. And you get older, you need a measurement to see accurately where you are. So, like that measurement, for the, I know they go to school and have exam results, maybe even to have that connotation think of stats whereas we know stats are very bad I'd love to have detailed stats about my coaches and my business and help but at that age because you get a couple that hurt you or you maybe associate them with judgment you don't they don't land as easily but as you get older you do start to embrace them and use them because then you don't want to hear you're pretty good what does that mean whereas when you're young you do want to hear you're pretty good and that's enough maybe a bit of that, what age they land with you at you know because and like even know. even like think of how think of how your performance goals would shape your would shape your shape your play, right? So for example, let's go. Imagine you know the tour players only make uh, a double every two to three rounds, yeah. right? Yeah. So so you're right. Okay. One of my goals for this event is I can only have two doubles for the whole event, right? And like, right, okay. So you go, okay, that's one of my one of my four for this event. And then you hit it down, hit it in the rough, you hit a decent shot out of the rough, 
but you kind of let short sighted yourself to a short side pin on the green running away from you over a bunker. And then you look at the shot and you go, I've had my double, like, I can't really, you know, I'm not going to take this on because I want to hit my goal of the doubles. And you, and you hit a little bit more conservative chip to about 15, 20 feet, and you can't, you can't put pull back, you may part. Whereas if you hadn't had that, like, underlying strategy, maybe you would have made a worse decision and taken double. Or even what? like uh, three pots, you know, th- only two, three pots for the tournament. You three pot the first two holes, and your focus totally changes. So you forget about your technique. You forget about, you don't worry about uh, missing a fairway because your focus is not three potting. And then Absol- if you say that can happen, then you you knock, you drop one in from 35 feet. Yeah. You hold, Absol- a, you hold, a, you hold a six footer for par when you absolutely need to. I like that. Uh, I've, done, I've done that one with Libby the last like, few events. And she said that, like, it's helped her so much where she might be on the second round and she's already had one three put the day before. And when she hits it to 40 feet, she's like, it's the first thing that comes into her head is like, okay, come on, we need to knuckle down here because I can't have another three put. I have to get this close. I have to hit a good put here. Whereas before, you might, if you didn't have that that, that strategy, you might be going, oh, oh, uh, you probably going to three put here again. Or you might yeah. even think of something, your mind might wonder. I better not three put. See, see, you're saying there about those types of things, don't it? And then go, circling back to we talked about how do you train in the correct conditions. I always wondered, and I see this is it sound easier than it is. I always wondered why people don't throw two or three events in a year just for practice. Just I'm going to go to the Mullingar Scratch Cup and I'm going to try all this stuff out in competitive conditions. But we get so wound up in world rankings and what the selectors think. You're on edge every time you play rather than going, you know, like even like a, a tour player, going to a couple of challenge tour events just purely to train and practice different things, different routines, take a round of golf. I said to Selfridge, once he did an Euro Pro, I said, he's going, I wonder what it would be if I'm getting better and driving the ball better and longer. I should be more aggressive. But when you do it next week in the challenge, no, nah, well, don't you go to a Euro Pro event and take a drive everywhere and just see what you learn. You know, I don't know why, because you can't really mock up a training event because then it's just 10 of your mates can run Royal Dublin. The, the only but thing that I, in, in fairness to Butch, and like, you know, like uh, Butch, Butch can like, he does come out with nuggets because like, he's oh, right, like, yeah. there's a reason. He said that he all, like, when he when he goes out with players, he's like, always have a number, always have a number you're trying to shoot. He was like, I, whenever I worked with Tiger, we always had an over under. Yeah. What was the over under here? 68 over under, like 66 over saying? under. Yeah, how many times have you heard Tiger say, like, I knew starting on 12 and I played the last seven and one under, I would win? Yeah, you know, like, I had a he number. Was, he was totally score orientated. I, 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 had, I had a number, I had a number that I was trying to shoot that day. I knew a number. And, like, and again, it's like, it's like, if you want to be, and maybe we're, I, I, if you want to be, like, goals are so powerful because they like, and, or targets, maybe stats is the wrong word, it's more targets. It's like, mm. it's like, uh, Measurable targets. Yeah, it's like, say for example. The, then it's going back on the practice and working on it in practice or training or do you need a technique change to help this? Do you need to do this to help that? Do you need to be more aggressive? Um, it's, it goes back to the training and the go, idea of go, going to, like... Go on out, can play, can, can, can play nine holes and being like, right, come on, three birdies. I want to, have, I want to see four chances inside 20 feet. And I want to see, I want to see one chance inside eight feet for birdie. That's your goal. Come on, let's go. I'm going to have to wrap this up in a couple of minutes, let's do All right. No bother, Joe. Chris, Johnny, as always, a pleasure. Part one of 14, complete. <laughs> Next week again. Let's, let's do this again where we come up with a topic and don't really talk about it at all. Talk about Tiger Woods. <laughs> yeah, let's start every week with a topic and then just like slowly, slowly graduate to the point where we just speak about Tiger. For Why not have no, top, no topic and then uh, we'll, we'll probably get one? <laughs> My challenge, Donald, is how can you take the topic of uh, majestic monasteries in Czechoslovakia to Tiger Woods winning the Masters last year? <laughs> <laughs> Hold my beer. <laughs>